Welcome everyone to season six, episode thirty-one of the Focus TV with Joan, Tavia Wyatt, Raven Lyons, Cardo Dudley Jr., and Wilson Tarpe Jr. And again, welcome to this week's edition of the Focus TV. Uh, Raven, go ahead and get started. The Washington Mystics. Oh man, so they've been busy since the last time we seen you guys, uh, and not in a good way. They're um they're zero and three since last Tuesday. Uh, they fell to the Lynx. The uh the wings and the Atlanta Dream respectively. Um yeah, they're they're struggling right now. Um, you know, we've been talking about their health for a while, but I mean they these have been manageable games for the most part. Um, you know, the only game uh, this past week that kind of got out of hand was against the wings. And um, you know, we we kind of felt like that was gonna be one of the tougher matchups. You know, given the um, the size of the wings front court and the, um, you know, and we all know what, what state the Mystics front court is in, um, you know, due to all the, the health and the injury concerns. So, yeah, and that, that game kind of, those deficiencies showed themselves. They were out-rebounded 48-21, to 21, uh, lost 90-62. Um, that'll pretty much do it, uh, you know, when, um, you know, you can't make a shot or you can't rebound and, um and giving the other team extra possessions, and they're getting easy looks on the inside. Uh, you know, that's, that's just how those things play out. Um, then on Sunday against the, the Atlanta Dream, um, they they just couldn't throw a rock in the ocean. Um, you know, the, the offense was super stagnant, um, just really couldn't get anything going. Uh, Brittany Sykes and Tiana Hawkins, which have, you know, pretty much been the two most consistent players during this um you know, during this time where they've been battling injuries, uh, they had 25 and 17, respectively. Uh, Tiana Hawkins also had 10 rebounds, but um, nobody else could really get it going. Uh, you know, a positive is they got to the line 25 times, but, you know, which is usually um, usually a deficiency for them. You know, they typically put the other team on the line more than they get to the line, but, you know, everywhere else was a nightmare offensively for them. Um, you know, and when you shoot 31% from the floor, it's going to be hard to beat anybody. So, um, yeah, man, they, they got to figure out a way to win some games until they can get whole again. You know, it's, we get it. It's an uphill battle, but you know, if you, you can't just chalk up every, every game to an L until people start getting back on the floor because by the time they get back, it might be too late. So, um, they got to figure it out, figure it out fast. Uh, you know, they were third, in the league last week, they're now, I'm sorry, they were fourth in the league last week. They're now seventh. So they're, they're dropping down the standards rapidly. And, um, you know, in the, in the season, uh, the end of the season is creeping up. So um, they got to start making some headway in a positive direction. Uh, you know, I don't know what that looks like for them. Uh, they, despite the injuries, they still seem to have enough to be in games. They just got to, they just got to tighten up those loose ends and um and come away with some victories because um you know they've to be perfectly honest they've been dropping some ones that uh you know they could have won and um you know when you're a team that with with uh, championship aspirations um you you got to be able to at least remain somewhat formidable through adversity um, and they're facing a lot of it right now but you know it, it's still no excuse you know dropping three games in a row at this point in the season is, um, you know, it, it could prove uh, hazardous, you know, to their playoff hopes. So, you know, hopefully they can um, they can figure it out. But, um, you know, if they don't, then, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, uh, they got two chances this week against a team that's – another team that's looking up at them in the standings. You got the Sparks, I think, back-to-back, uh, back-to-back home games. Uh, and they need both of them. You know, just be, be frank. They, they need both of those games. Nah, uh, you know, when, when Ray checks in with you guys next week, you know, he will, he'll let you know how things went. All right, Octavia, uh, getting closer and closer to, you know, uh, pad, uh, not, well, we had padded practices this week and closer to, uh, what's it called, uh, opposing team fights and joint practices. We get closer <laughs> and closer. So what you got for us this week at FC all, East All Season update? Yeah. Yeah, everything you said is 100% right. We are officially in the era of padded practices. Um, most teams have their first padded practice, if not Monday, today. 
Um, and then also we're getting closer and closer to joint training camp practices as we get closer to actual preseason games. Um, so those are always interested. Um, over the weekend, we saw, well, maybe not a lot, but over the weekend, we saw, you know, some team on team fights, you know, offense on defense fights. So I'm sure we'll get to see the team versus another team fight coming up soon. Um, <clears throat> and if it wasn't for social media, I don't know where I would have been as far as forgetting that there is actual football going to be played this week. Um, there'll be the Hall of Fame game is this Thursday. Um, it is the Jets and our camera girls who they play against. So all they talk about is the Jets at this point. So them or somebody else. Um, so it's a lot going on. But as far as NFC East, not too much really going on. Like I said, most of the teams have had their first full padded practice. Um, some other little caveats of things have been happening. But <clears throat> for the Dallas Cowboys, pretty much the only – other news coming out recently is that running back Ronald Jones has been suspended for the first two games of the season um, for violating the NFL policy on performance enhancing sus uh, substances. The NFL suspended Dallas Cowboys running back for the two games. Um, on Tuesday, he failed a test, but he has since come out and pretty recently and stated that the failed test was due to some heart medication that he's been prescribed since he's entered the league. He says while he's say he's he knows he's responsible for what he puts in his body and is disappointed by the NFL's decision um so unfortunately he'll be out two games to start the season as the Dallas Cowboys are trying to figure out what their rotation is going to be um we know Tony Pollard is going to be number one I think Jerry Jones has recently also refloated the idea of letting Zeke come back maybe I know Zeke had a a visit with the New Orleans, the, New Orleans the, um, the Patriots um, New England Patriots. So we'll see how that shakes out for him. Um, there's been a lot of chatter about Deuce Vaughn um, in, in training camp. Uh, a lot of people are, well, I don't say a lot of people, I don't know. People are saying that it's giving him Darren Sproles feels very small, very fast. There's a great clip of him just pretty much running through the entire defense. Um, it's a great story as we know of, but I'm still interested to see who else is going to be, you know, in that rotation. Is he going to be able to actually crack the roster? Um, they have Rico Dottle still there. I know this thing with um, uh, Ronald Jones, who they recently signed in the offseason to, to bring in to pretty much be with the depth. So um, hopefully this PED situation or heart medication situation doesn't sway them from not from him not making the roster. So we'll probably just need to have a really, really strong camp. Um, they all also had an injury. Cowboys defensive end Sam Williams suffered a shoulder injury earlier um, in their padded practice. Um the severity of it, it's not really, they don't know right now. Um, he's a youngster that they really like in their rotation. Um, and they say he'll be out for a little while, but they'll see if he's able to get back in as, you know, as training camp continues. Um, and the big news from last week, of course, with Trayvon Dick signing his extension, um, which is kind of, he signed it the first day before practice and he still has not practiced. As of that time, he's actually practiced for the first time today. He had a bruised toe. Um, that kept him out for a little while. So he was able to get in some work today, him, Stefan Gilmore, and some others. <clears throat> so they're all still working. Like I said, not much going on. Uh, Dak is, you know, being vocal. Michael Parsons is being vocal. Um, as we know, those are their vocal leaders. <laughs> um, so um, I know I watched a couple of the um, inside training camp um, around uh, this past week on NFL Network, and they showed a lot of interviews. They interviewed Brandon Cooks. He seems pretty happy in the decision that he made to be in Dallas. Um, and he's looking forward to, you know, continuously continuing the string of positive seasons that he's had. So we'll see how the whole wide receiver room shakes out for them. Um, and then really just seeing how, what Mike McCarthy is really going to call. Um, a lot of hoopla in the offseason about – is it going to be a more run-heavy uh, offense? I think he's recently come out and said he's pretty, pretty much looking at it to be kind of how it was last year. Um, but, again, you never know with Mike McCarthy. I guess we'll just have to see when the season starts or maybe even possibly in preseason. Moving on to the Washington Commanders. Again, not a whole lot going on with them as well. Um, just from some notes from their training camp. Um, today and yesterday. Um, Sam Howe and Jahan Dotson are seeming to have a pretty good connection. Um, Sam Howe um, is in his second full season. You know, he didn't play too much last year. He's slated as the starting quarterback 
for them. Um, and it's interesting to see him and then see what Eric the enemy is going to do. That's probably the biggest um, thing I'm looking forward to, to see how their offense works with the likes of Eric the enemy. Um, he's a great football mind. A lot of us believe he should already be a head coach in the NFL um, to move from a, a, a offensive coordinator of the Kansas city chiefs to now the offensive coordinator of the Washington commanders. Um, I'm just interested to see what they do. Um, with him, Terry McLaurin, um, Jahan Dotson, um, just to see, you know, how things will shape up. But they're showing that Sam Do- Sam Howell and Jahan Dotson are pretty – having a good connection as far as, you know, getting the ball to him and the reps that they're going through. So that's encouraging for them. Um, he's starting to get a little bit better. You know, um, how again, like I said, second year. Um, it's It's got to be hard to be a second-year player and – already going to be, you know, starting quarterback for the Washington Commanders, who's had a new starting quarterback in the last six seasons. Um, so I'm interested to see how he shakes out for him. And then another thing that they're looking into is who is going to be their primary uh, punt returner. Um, they had Jahan Dotson um, running some of those reps. Um, and you would think he's probably not going to be the primary one because they probably actually really need him on offense. So you don't really want to risk him in special teams. So it's interesting to see who they'll have back there. They had Dax Milne last year with little success. Um, they've been working out Casimir Allen, um, who's an undrafted uh, rookie, um, to see if he'd be able to, you know, help in that area and make the team. So again, just little things going on in their camp. Camps are still pretty fairly new. Um, so we'll see how things continue to go with the Washington Commanders. Um, again, not much going on for the Philadelphia Eagles as well. Um, they also had their first padded practice recently as well. Um, probably just the biggest things that, you know, that I've heard from the dra- uh, the training camp notes. Um, there's a lot of buzz on Nolan Smith. Um, as we knew, Nolan Smith would be good. Um, but I think that the biggest thing that they thought that he probably wouldn't get too many reps this year being behind the likes of Josh Sweat, Hassan Reddick, Brandon Graham. Um, but he's he's flashing a lot. A lot of people are noticing him a lot. Um, so who knows if he'll really be able to break himself into the, the rotation sooner than later. Um, Quez Watkins is another question mark just because he had a pretty decent season last year. And he had a not so decent season last year. The year before, he was pretty decent. Um, he kind of fell off a little bit last year, and now he's showing flashes again. So we'll see how that works out for him. Um, yes, on the screen, that's another big thing that's been released this weekend. The Kelly Greens are officially back for them for their um, throwback seasons. I believe it's game week seven and week twelve. They'll be wearing them. Um, and I mean, what's crazy is like somebody actually leaked it. It's wild because it wasn't really supposed to get announced until Monday, but somebody leaked it on Saturday, um, which is crazy. And apparently they actually had like people were lined up outside of the stadium at like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. to get the releases because apparently they did not put a cap on how many you could get. So basically somebody could go online and buy 1,200 <laughs> if they wanted to. Um, so that was crazy. That's probably the biggest news was this Kelly Green hole release that came out. Um, so outside of that, not too much going on as long as everybody's staying healthy. Um, everything's good. Um, last but not least, New York Giants. Um, the Giants placed center J.C. Hosner on injured reserve and signed uh, Sean Harlow. Uh, so J.C. Hosner has a torn tricep, so he's expected to miss quite a few t- uh, a bit of time. Um, and then, yes, the biggest name coming out of the uh, out of their training camp outside of, you know, your Saquons and Dan Jones and things like that is Jalen Hyatt. Um, he's fast. <laughs> he's really, really fast. Uh, and he's showing that in this camp. Again, like I said last week, I'm I'm looking forward to see how he plays because I feel like him and Devontae Smith have a similar body structure, slimmer um, and fast, good route runners. Um, I'm interested to see if it can translate into the league for him as it did for Devontae. Um, Because if you stop and think about it, they have some pretty decent um, pass catchers, if you want to include wide receivers and tight ends for the New York Giants as of now. Um, It's just really about putting it all together, and I really feel like it all really just depends on what Daniel Jones is going to do. 
Um, we know he didn't really have too many people to throw the ball to last year outside of Saquon. Um, now he has a little bit more, you know, with the Darren Wallers of the world. Um, we'll see how they're able to shake that out. But again, their first pad of practice as well. Um, but he's been their biggest standout so far. Um, he's been super fast and just, I mean, playing well from everything that I've seen so far. So again, and then probably the other biggest thing is uh, pin, the pinout inter, uh, interception that was happened that has been all over the internet this past weekend. The one hand interception, I mean, it's great. He has big hands, <laughs> I guess. And it was a great play for them. Um, see if it translates over into the actual games um, against other teams. So at this point, training camp is just pretty much training camp. Again, a lot of work in for all the teams and, just interested to see how it all translates into the field for them once we actually get into the preseason games that will be coming up sooner rather than later. All right, I just had to put this up here real quick. This is the catch everyone was going crazy about the other day. Uh, one handed. I mean, he actually didn't use the other hand, which is kind of crazy. But, you know, people have been starving for football. But it's a fire catch, especially with that, that inside hand. Um, I, I want to, uh, my only beef with the uh, what's it called the training camp clips for everybody, y'all gonna stop hiding what quarterbacks throwing these picks. <laughs> Some of you teams are very interesting, very very interesting. Stop hiding them. Um, again, that could be a whole another conversation for another day. Gonna take our first break when we get back. Quick update with DC United. Um, then you know another break and we'll see what Cardo has for us. Rapid fire. I think I know the first topic. Uh, you know, it's kind of sort of a fight this past weekend. So. Probably getting That's what you want to call it. <laughs> That's very mature, Octavia. But uh, <laughs> you didn't do it. So, again, I can't wait to that part of the show because uh, I'm sure there'll be several more uh, mature responses to what some of us sat and watched this past Saturday night. you watch watching the full East TV. We'll return shortly. Welcome back to the Focus TV. Uh, as, for, as far as the DC United update goes, look, uh, no MLS play. A lot of MLS teams been in the, have been in a taking in part of the League's Cup uh, League's Cup tournament. Uh, they had two games last week, DC United, that is. They beat Montreal 1-0. Then they fell to Pumas 3-0. Despite the loss, uh, DC United advanced to the round of 32, and they'll play the Philadelphia Union in League Cup action uh, on Thursday, and that's in um, the knockout round. So we'll see how that goes. From a personnel standpoint, the black and red agree with terms, uh, ag agreed two terms with Belgian Pro League side KAS Yupin uh, for a permanent transfer for midfielder Victor Paulson. Paulson was one of the players they uh, they acquired last year. Um, you know, uh, just that quick, right before the windows closed. I think the window officially closed Tuesday. Uh, we're recording at, at the time recording this, so you know hours from now. Um, and then in terms of bringing a player in. DC United uh, did this. Uh, they signed Brazilian midfielder Gabriel Pirani on loan from Santos FC, the Brazilian Serie A, pending receipt of his P1 visa. Pirani's on loan through December 31st, 2023, with an option to buy. Uh, the 21-year-old midfielder would be coming to a team that no longer has the services of one Lewis O'Brien, who went back to Nottingham. Uh, and then we just talked about Victor Paulson. We just left, so there's certainly a need. We'll see how he fits in. Um, you know, similar to the Mystics, they're 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 teetering on that invisible that uh, invisible line of postseason, not postseason. So once they get back into play, which would be next week in terms of league play, uh, you know they they got a hill to climb. But it starts first um, on Thursday. They take on Philadelphia in the League Cups. All right, when we return, rapid fire. Welcome back to the Focus TV. As promised, rapid fire. Cardell, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Uh, um, on the NFL side of things, something caught my attention uh, earlier. A little bit of petty. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett, uh, former Broncos coach, uh, addressed criticism from Sean Payton, current Broncos coach, for the first time on Tuesday, where he said there's a code, uh, there's a way things are done, but referring to coaching. He said the whole situation was unfortunate and it sucks. 
but was happy to calm his name come during the season when the two teams are set to face off in week five. Uh, quote, I'm almost thankful we got that out of the way. You understand the way certain people feel and think hack it to reporters. When I'm talking about uh, Peyton calls waves last week when he took several shots at Hackett, the former Broncos coach, who is he, who is he has replaced. Uh, he said that everything he heard about last season, we're doing the opposite. When referring to the job Hackett did in 2022, when the team finished five and twelve, Hackett was fired before the end of the season in his first year in Denver. Quote: It might have been one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. Peyton said, "That's how bad it was." Jeez, we uh, Octavia. Um, you like a little petty here and there. You, you I do. Some. And I actually, I loved this petty, to be completely honest. Um, because, I mean, Sean Payton just said what everybody was thinking. Like, I mean, I mean granted, most people, I mean, I guess the whole code thing where you don't, you know, really call out another head coach in the media. Cool, I get that. But I don't think he was lying. Um, I'm pretty sure that Nathaniel Hackett had to hire a coach to coach him on how to coach the team. So I would be saying we're doing the complete opposite as well. Um, you know, it like I said, it was a little petty because the caliber of coach that Sean Payton is, like he didn't need to say it because we all knew it anyway. But I don't know. Maybe he was trying to, you know, prove a point to his team, say, I don't know what was happening, but I loved it. Uh, you know, the I mean, we all knew the thing Hackett was just just awful <laughs> it was just awful um so i mean no lies were told maybe some feelings were hurt in the midst of it that's fine but i i liked it i like what he said i like the rebuttal like whatever you want to say that's fine because we all know if you actually watched and i'm and it's crazy i don't even have to say you watched any of the games last year even if you watched the highlights of the games last year you could tell that they don't hack it and know what he was doing. He, he was completely lost. So now maybe he's back in his natural element where he has a coach to coach him. He'll be okay. All right. Yeah, they they must have some beef that nobody knows about because, like, that. I mean, Octavia was right. He didn't lie, but. It's it's rare that you see a coach go straight at another coach's neck like that. Like that's <laughs> crazy. But, um, but I mean, a way to avoid all this would have been to be good at your job. So, I mean, it's, the most he can say is he said mean things that were also true. So I don't know where we go from here. Um, like it's not like. <laughs> Like, it's not like he lied on him or, like, but, yeah, it's it, it was just weird that he, like, went hard at him like that. But, um, but yeah, man, it was it was, it was pretty bad. Um, so, yeah, but he got to just take that one on the chin. Wilson. Hey, hey Sean Payton's back. Um, you know, uh, clearly he doesn't feel that this gentleman is one of his peers. Uh, so, you know, he... he, he he shared how he felt. And who knows how he perceives the current situation of the team he inherited after dude had the team. Also, I think it was a message to his new team. I don't know what y'all did last year. I don't know what happened. I don't know what dude allowed y'all to do. No. No. Just no. But yeah, Sean Payne's... I would say he's wrong, but like... Dude had to hire an adult to supervise him last year, so... It is what it is. Yeah, I, I agree. Right. I agree with Wilson. I, I really think it was just a message he was sending to uh, the franchise as a whole, the team as a whole, through this. Like, none of that BS is going down this year. Like, don't even think about it. And, and I think most of us probably aimed at Russell Wilson, like, homie, after the season you had last year. Don't be asking for no perks and say, I need results. That's all That's all I need. I need work, and I need results. Other than that, what are we talking about? You know, it's time to show and prove because, look, it, it was. It was it was horrible watching that. Like, it, it was fans in the stand that could have coached better. Like, some of the decisions he made, which were, like, elementary-level 
coaching decisions, going for it on fourth down, you take yourself out of field goal range to, to win close ball games. Just it's, it's silly stuff, man. Like it, it and what it really showed was is that he was shook. Like he knew he didn't have the respect of men in that locker room. And he was he panicked. He tried to overthink it because he felt that energy. And um he lost everybody fairly quickly. He lost everybody. And um he tried to hitch his wagon to Russell Wilson, but when Russell Wilson wasn't performing, it didn't had it didn't carry the same weight. So they wasn't listening to Russell either. It was just like, homie, we need you to do your job. And you saw wide receivers getting frustrated. They'd be, they be wide open. Russ wasn't getting them the ball. So it's just, it was just a disaster, man. And um, look, I ain't met, <laughs> like Sean, Sean Payton ain't live. No, he didn't. Like, it was one of the worst coaching jobs in NFL history. Like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to really think of a, a, a coach that was that damn bad. Like, it's hard. I can't think of one like that bad. Where it was just like you're totally out your league. Like, why are you here? You see what I'm saying? Like, you don't even deserve to be. A, why are you an NFL? I, I ain't gonna lie. It was times that like you should be exiled from the NFL. You look that bad, but he bounced back as a coordinator. So I, I'm trying to figure out what the, he 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 something. He got some connections, a network, uh, complexion for the connection type stuff. Cause I know damn well if that was a brother, he'd be exiled. It'd be a rap. We won't hear from him no more. But it, it was just a disaster, man. And um, look, Peyton, Peyton sent the message, man. But damn, um, yeah, that one hurt. But like Ray said, man, sometimes you just gotta take it on the chin. It's the truth. Like you got like like a, a topic we're gonna discuss in a few. He took it on the chin. He ain't making no excuses. Literally, <laughs> in, in, in various ways. <laughs> He, but he owned it as a man. Sometimes you just gotta own it, man. But yeah, it was bad. It was pain. No, I, I ain't even watched a lot of games after a while. I, mean, I couldn't do that to myself. Um, that was that was just. I was asking for like no disrespect, like cancer or something like from the stress, man. It was bad. It was it was horrible watching the Broncos play last year. They almost made me come back to DC, though. I was about to be back as a <laughs> free agent fan. It was that bad, man. But we gonna move on, man. We gonna stay on the NFL side of things. Uh Ray's favorite owner, uh, this guy, he, he gonna make news. Uh, <laughs> Cowboys owner Jerry Jones refuses to make promises of a Super Bowl, but there is no question he feels good about the team. The Cowboys mm-hmm. will win in 2023, one that, that is decidedly better on paper than that what franchise ended the season with. He wouldn't say if this was their best opportunity to get to the Super Bowl, he did offer a warning to the Philadelphia Eagles and other teams in the NFC East. Quote, I would say that Philadelphia, and if you will, the Giants and Washington team, they need to be on their game because we are, Jones said. We're going to be on our game, and we will be improved over last year. I don't want to dismiss how accomplished Philadelphia is, the year that they had last year, and where they're starting this year. I don't want to dismiss that. And the Giants definitely have a chance to be better, and Washington could be really energized. So I don't need to handicap it relative to where we're going to end up. Just us, we are better. Ray, uh, we're gonna start with you, man. Uh, what's your thoughts on Jarrah? This issue and I want us to the rest of the NFC East. Um, that, that was shockingly reasonable coming from him. <laughs> like, I mean, no, like, no promises of <laughs> of grand uh Super Bowl victories or nothing like that. I mean, he, he feels the way. Somebody should feel in a position where they feel like they have a competent team. I mean, you know, he's not supposed to come out there and say they're going to lose every game. Um, going a little overboard with the Eagles stuff, I think. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I got no issue with, with what he said. Um, they have uh, made some improvements. Um you know, some other stuff needs to be figured out, but um, but yeah, man. I mean, but the thing about it is, more often times than not, they look good on paper and they come out and go five hundred. So maybe in his position, he should just say, "I feel good about the team, and let's go ahead and throw the balls out and see what happens." Um, yeah, don't don't make any promises because the. The motto since '96 has been uh, over-promise and under-deliver. So, 
yeah, just just let just just see how it plays out, man. Um, but but honestly, I I think they are in a good position to have uh you know have a a, a pretty solid season. Um, so yeah, hopefully you know they can maximize their potential and um you know and and not make them out to eat his words. Wilson might be the first time in history that man they come out here and say something 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 Super Bowl. I ain't even shocked. Um, growth, old age, <laughs> father time. What's happening? Um, I'm with Ray. It was actually reasonable. Like issuing issuing a you know a no a disclaimer is reckless and stupid and very unserious. However, um, this is Jerry we're talking about, so the bar's the bar. Uh, what was said is just reasonable. Yeah, yuck. I, I'm disappointed. Uh, I'll tell you how you feel about him challenging your ego and say he coming for y'all head. I was gonna say uh, I feel like I'm the only one that's gonna say this is not reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need, in the words of Aaron Rodgers, I'm gonna need Jerry Jones to keep my team's name out of his mouth. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna need to happen. Um, because it was to me, it was just a roundabout way of, of trying to say what he always says, which is fine, which is cool. And, like, don't get me wrong, like, I do think that they're going to – every year I think – well, not every year, but for the last couple of years, I thought they were a good team and they have always are going to ride with us. Last year, for, for as many people as it surprised, it surprised me, too, as of how good we were last year. So I'm not oblivious to the fact that things can go the opposite way or that there can be, you know, good and healthy competition in the NFC East because everybody is getting better. Um, like I said, with the new ownership for the commanders, I like it, but I don't like it because now I feel like they're going to turn into a functioning franchise and that's just somebody else we got to worry about. So it seems like all the other unfunctioning or dysfunctional franchises with the, the giants and the commanders, now they're starting to get stable. We've been stable. Jerry is Jerry. So they're, they're Jerry stable. Um, it's cool. So while yes, I understand the whole, not saying the Super Bowl word, but there's been a lot of shots fired, not just from Jerry. This, it, and it's just going to keep going just because of, I'll be honest, the rivalry, of course, in the NFC East. And then this whole nobody's won the NFC East back-to-back years since like 2003, 2004. So if Philly won last year. That means Dallas has to win this year. So, but, but Philly went to the Super Bowl and Dallas can't get over that. Like, there's always going to be that that squirm, squirmish or whatever you want to call it. There's always going to be that. Um, but, yeah, I just don't want them to, to say our names. Just keep us out of it. Just say we're going to be good. We're going to do what we got to do. Dak not going to throw no picks. We're going to have good running backs. Our defense is going to be great. Whatever you want to say, that's cool. Just just don't don't, don't bring us in. Just don't don't put my team's name in your mouth. We're good over here. My only thing is these days, why do everybody feel the need to talk that haven't done? Like, I, it's like everybody talking. It's just like you. I feel like Nas and Ethan at the beginning. You, what? It's just like all day. Like, you, you, like, you got to do something to talk, man. And the people that actually do the damage, be quiet. Like, but we were about to talk about Bud Crawford. We went to fight. Next thing I know, I see on Twitter, yeah, this doing a track meet. But the whole boxing world calling him out for a fight. Like, what the? You see what I'm saying? It's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Some, a lot of y'all tripping. But that's what I see in every league, man. Just why are the people that haven't gotten it done are always the ones talking? And Jerry's got – no, Jerry hasn't gotten it done. That was Jimmy Johnson. We ain't even about to do that. Those Super Bowls are Jimmy Johnson. So he hasn't really gotten it done, and he's been trying to get it done ever since. It, all right, man, I guess he got to talk, man. Age, man. He at that age. You know how old people are. They don't care. No filter. They just let it out. I guess that's the excuse, man. But, but like I said, man, look, it, you could big up your team. Like, I feel good about our chances this year. But, man, you can't knock a team that was in the bowl, man, like, that went through your division with, with the ease. You see what I'm saying? Like, including you. It just it just doesn't make sense. It, it's And now you done called out basically the other three teams in the division. So now it's going to be even more on top of just the normal, you know, intensity. 
and they're gonna take pride in trying to slaughter you. And all for what? So, oh boy. Control, man, exercise control. NBA side, uh, in a wake up posturing about the Portland Trail Blazers star Damian Lillard's desire to play for the Miami Heat only by his agent Aaron Goodwin, the NBA sent the memo to all 30 teams Friday stating that any player or his agent who makes public or private comments indicating he won't fully perform the services called for under his player contract in the event of a trade will be subject to discipline. The memo, which was obtained uh, by various media outlets, said that the league had interviewed Lillard and Goodwin following ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski reporting earlier this month that Goodwin called other teams and warned them against trading for Lillard because he would be unhappy anywhere but Miami. Goodwin also stated in the multiple outlets that his client wanted to play only for the Heat. The NBA said in the memo that Goodwin denied stating or indicating to any team that Lillard would refuse to play for them. It went on to say that the relevant teams provided descriptions of their communication with Goodwin that were mostly, though not entirely, consistent with Goodwin's statements to us. Leonard Goodwin told the NBA he would fulfill his contract regardless of where he was traded. Uh, Wilson, um, do you like how the NBA came down in the situation and to check all that funny stuff? Yeah, because he was the first dude to do. Why are you doing all this out loud? Let the let the reporters like let Shams and Woj do all that like everybody else does. What were y'all doing? Like you took it a step forward because before this, the NBA sat here quietly. Where everyone's done everything like usually again it's done through you know the the mouthpieces that be and you know after a little while you know it happens and you know whatever happens happens but yeah i'm happy that the nba finally somebody stood up and said something because it's it's been getting out of control but again think about what lengths it, it took for the league to say something and then even i think we were talking what was it last week just or the week before just talking about you know the the players doing this as a whole and where Dame's at in terms of those players that have tried to do that. And what are we doing here? But I'm happy the league stepped up and said something. Yeah, I was the same way. Um, I just hope that if it came down to it, that they would really enforce it. Cause I get tired of hearing about like, Oh, we sent a memo. It's like, okay, cool. Memos are cool and all, but like, I, if it if it came down to it, I want to see them actually really enforce it. But yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, because we talked about this last week that it's just ridiculous with all of this and saying like I'm not gonna play for nobody else if I get traded or I'm gonna be a disgruntled employee. Um, and then I believe there was reports today that came out that said that no other team has really offered anything for Dane either. And at this point, to me, it's, I would think it's because, well, he already said he ain't going to play for us, so why would we offer anything? So I don't know if this memo is going to help any other teams decide if they want to at least put their, their hat in the ring at this point um, or what's going to happen with the situation. Because, I mean, he, he what, requested it like a month ago at this point, and there's really been no movement on it. Um, I still think it's terrible to handicap a franchise like that. A franchise has done a lot for you. Um to say you only want to go to one team, but I appreciate, I approve them, you know, coming out and, you know, basically I feel like standing up for the actual franchises and letting them know, like, we're not going to tolerate stuff like that. Um, I would be interested to see what these disciplinary actions would include. Um, but it's, it's nice to see that they actually have put some thought into it um, to try to mitigate some of these things from happening in the future. Right. Yeah, man, that's that's just being a jackass at that point. Like Wilson said, man, just go through the steps, feed it to the mouthpieces, let them put it out, and let the chips fall where they may. But you put that out on company letterhead, bro. Like, why why are you doing that? <laughs> like you, like at that point, the NBA was just like, "Are right, you just trying to chump us now?" So, you know, we gotta knock you down a few pegs because. Like we, it's bad enough we in this position already. I'm tired of hearing about this, um, but to just like come out and just like you yourself strong arm your way, like and your Dame Lillard, yeah, not rocking. Um, you know if if it was, uh, like if Giannis was behaving like this or something like that, I'm not sure that memo goes out to be perfectly honest. You know, so um, yeah, man. But it, 
they they got to do something at this point because um, what Cardell always says all the time, the inmates run the asylum. Like they gotta they gotta regain some level of control, or it's just only gonna get worse. Yeah, I think like y'all said, it's just a reflection of this current era of the NBA. How the, you know you gotta look at the commissioner. He he's let it go too far, trying to cooperate with him, and this is why you can't. You know you 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 you. You reward with players that have given you sweat equity on the team. You give them a little bit more rope than the others. Uh, but even then, it's a line like, all right, that's enough. Like, you got to understand what it is. It's a pecking order, and you can either follow that, stay in that pecking order, or you can roll. Um, it's really up to you. I just don't like how the players are just – it's not even that – they hide behind the fact that if you want – if the average, average person wanted to leave a nine-to-five and go to another job, it's okay for them. So why can't they do it? But I'm like the average nine to five person aren't fr- like faces of a multi billion dollar establishment one, uh, faces of a city with all types of people connected to them, whether it be emotionally or one way or emotion or connected to them because they're fans of the team. And you're in and one important note: the salary differs very differently from most nine to five people. You're, you, it's not the typical job. So with certain things, when you get a lot, a lot comes with that. So you can't just move because you become become disgruntled and you feel like you're not in a position to win, especially if you consider yourself a top tier player. Because my my reply to those guys that always move like that is, you're supposed to be the reason the team wins. So maybe you're not as good as you think you are. But you don't want to hear that, though. You see what I'm saying? So... Maybe the team made a mistake investing all their resources into you because maybe it just came out. It just dawned on everybody like, you're not that dude. But they would never just say that to themselves, like, I'm not that dude. You know what I'm saying? So they look for other reasons and other ways to attack. And one of those ways is is, is to get about a situation and go tag team another team or get on another team and tag team with guys and hopefully win. When we've seen that, that don't guarantee anything. So that further makes you look bad. When you go play with multiple All-Stars and you still can't get it done. Think about it. The KD and Warriors, that was about as nuclear as you can get as an NBA team. They only got two rings out of it. They went to three finals, but they only got two. Same thing with Braun, d Wade, and Bosch. Another nuclear team started this whole thing. They only got two rings out of it. It guarantees nothing. It guarantees nothing. You still got to hoop. You still got to elevate your game. You still have to sacrifice. You still have to do different things to win. And the funny thing about – the thing I love about basketball, the one thing you try to avoid, try to take shortcuts around, it usually pops back up. You still have to face that challenge one way or another to get what you want. And in the the end, it's harder to get what you want than it was in the beginning when you try to take the shortcut. It always works out that way. So you might you better off just fighting, man. Especially with a franchise that's basically treat you, give you the Reggie Miller treatment. That's rare. That's rare, bro. So you ask for a trade, you strong. I mean, like you trying to go to Miami, and I'm like, you going to Miami, and it's just like, I'm looking at my. That still don't guarantee nothing. You you guaranteed to beat you guaranteed to beat the. I mean, I know y'all went to the finals. Y'all lucked over y'all is getting hurt. Boston more so beat themselves than y'all beat them. They were just being crazy. Uh, New York's coming. You got a bunch of young teams that are also on the verge. Philly, they're still a threat. I mean, the Cleveland young, but they're coming. They're still trying to figure it out. They're they're there. It, it's it's not that easy, man. It's just it's just not that easy. It's not a given. So look, he's entitled to do what he wants with his career, but has some decency and professionalism when you're trying to do this, man. Like they late, like Ray said, they're blatantly trying to strong on. They like he he was on some sugar night, y'all. Like coming coming in with the goons, sign the contract, dog. Or oh, we gonna hang you upside down over the balcony, bro? Like what's it gonna be? You see what I'm saying? And I'm like, if you force an NBA hand, and and this is one of those times I wish, rest in peace, man. David Stern was still alive. It would not get this far. I promise you, my man be done, dog. <laughs> He'd be in, he'd be calling a press conference apologize. I would like to apologize for my my my, my professionalism. Like seriously, it get real. Because one thing David Stern wasn't about to let nothing get punk him. Get, nah, no, nah. So I feel like we need a little bit more of that play. But I just don't know. It, it's gone too far with Silver Man. He he got a 
he got to reel it back in because it, it's become disrespectful, man. So and, and we'll see what happens. But yeah, Dane love I used to rock with Dane one hundred percent. But this this, this, this don't sit well. Right? You 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 looking funny in the light right now, and it's just real. You can't hide behind that. So we move on to obviously the big story, sports story over the weekend. Terrence Crawford. Uh, Understatement, he made it look very easy as he disposed of Errol Smith Jr. Uh, during Saturday's welterweight title fight in Vegas. Uh, despite Spence entering the fight, having never been knocked down or knocked out in his professional career, but Crawford managed to record three knockdowns, including two in the seventh round and ended things in the ninth after a stoppage from the referee. Uh, with this win, Crawford became the first mailboxer to ever win undisputed titles in two different weight divisions during the four belt era. Uh, the fight was officially stopped by referee Harvey Dog with, with around 2 minutes, 32 seconds remaining in the ninth round. Uh, by then, it was clear that Crawford was massively ahead of Spence on all school cards, having outlanded his opponent 185 to 96. Uh, Crawford improved to 40-0, 31 knockouts in his boxing career, and is now the owner of all four 147-pound championship belts, the IBF, WBA, WBC, and WBO, man. Uh, Ray, man, just just what were your thoughts on honestly one of the most dominant ass whooping world champion fights I've seen in my life? Man, I I was thoroughly impressed. Um, you know, I I wasn't sure how it was gonna go, but I figured either way it was gonna go it was gonna be close. But I was clearly wrong because <laughs> after the first round. You know, Bud downloaded the information and did yeah. that update. <laughs> Version 2.0 came out, walked right through that dude for the next eight rounds. Like, that was – it was bad, man. You know, but it was just a master class from Crawford. You know, he – it looked like – looked like he was just more prepared. You know, he was sharper. Um, and Spence didn't have an answer. Um yeah, man. Like, if it was any question before, it's definitely not one now. Crawford, the best box on the, on the face of the earth, um, and I don't I don't see anybody changing that anytime soon. Um, you know, there's talks about who he's going to fight next. Um, yeah, after, after the way he walked through him, um, I, I I really don't think people lining up for that because. In the state of boxing now, people are already ducking and dodging and running around each other. No, nobody's nobody's willingly getting in front of that man after after the display he put on. Um, you know, it might be a couple guys out there like uh like Boots Ennis, um, you know, guys like that, but yeah, that that was just pure dominance. Um and you know, and and, and kudos to Spence, man. You know, he what, what what could he say? You know, he said Crawford was the better man, you know, and, and it's wild that he just accepted what it is and people are making excuses. Like, how many excuses can you make for that? Like, and then, you know, people bringing up the car accident and all of that, but he's walked through every opponent since the accident. So Crawford was just better. Like, it's there's no other way to describe it, man. Like and I'm a I'm a Spence fan, like, but it is what it is. It, I, after seeing that, and you come away saying anything except Bud totally outclassed him and beat his ass, then you're in denial. Um, but yeah, man, I like I'm I'm sure Spence will bounce back. Um, and let let's be clear, nobody's doing that to him except <laughs> except Bud Crawford. So all this other stuff, people talking like this one loss just negates everything he's ever done. They need to chill because. Ain't nobody in a rush to line up in front of him neither. So um, so yeah, man, it'll I'm anxious to see what he does next. Uh they talking about that rematch. Um, I think they need to leave that alone because unless he about to revamp everything, <laughs> I, I don't see it going much different, man. Um, but yeah, man, it was you know, typically one side of fights like this don't live up to the hype, but the magnitude of this fight and for Crawford to dominate the way he did, like that's historic. So it, it definitely lived up for me. You know, that was that was um that was a sight to see, man. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Wilson. Hey man, it was it was 
was just art. Man went to work. You put on the show. Um, I, th- I feel like it was like two minutes in the first round. Two minutes left in the first round. I feel like Spence caught caught Bud like flush right on the button. And you kind of saw Bud kind of like what Ray was talking about. Like hit, like you can see you can see the algorithms moving. Like that's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then you saw somebody who's very comfortable adjusting, go about their business. It was beautiful to watch. Um, and like Ray said, um, it was refreshing to see somebody just give the other person credit instead of giving us a laundry list of excuses. And, you know, maybe if we fought on that day instead of this day, or I ate something funny, or, you know, like you said, with the car accident, which has nothing to do with that right there at all. Um, it was a great fight, and I'm looking forward to see whoever steps in front of Bud next, see if they fare any better. But um, boxing is one of those rare things, you know, like tennis, where uh, there's nobody else in there with you. You know, <laughs> if we find out very quickly exactly what it's going to be. But I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was domination. I'll tell you. Um, yeah, so I actually um, went to Houston this past weekend, so I watched the fight in Houston. Um, and with Earl Spence being from Dallas, you know, Texas, just the whole thing. So I actually watched the fight amongst a bunch of Texans, and they were losing it <laughs> the entire time. Like, what is happening right now? Um, I mean, like you all have already said, but thoroughly whooped him it was hard to watch at times because i just i've never seen spence in that type of situation where it just looks like he didn't know what to do (laughs) it just looks like at one point and i mean i always find it funny at the end of fights when the refs called it and they'd be like no i'm still good and i'm like no no um you're not because when they showed the replay you literally got hit like seven times in a row um, his hands wasn't even up protecting himself any, anymore. And it just looks like he was leaning forward with his face. So I was just like, yeah, it just it just did not look good. And I was, you know, the hype around this fight was huge. I was expecting for it to be a lot closer than it was. But Bud just didn't even look like he got, like, flustered at all. Like, it didn't look like he was, um, like, confused on how he wanted to move. Like, it didn't, like, I feel like his face didn't change the entire time. Like, he was, like, dialed in, locked in. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And to be honest, I think he took it a little bit easy on Spence at the end because I think he could have really, he could have really, really hurt, like, knock, knocked him out for real for Like, I felt like Bud felt a little bit bad for him, but to be completely honest, um, because it was that bad. Like, I've never, I, I've never seen Spence fight or, or not fight. <laughs> um, in a situation like that. Um, but again, it just shows you, like you said, both of them are great boxers. Like like Ray said, also, like you can't just dispute um, everything that Spence has done in his entire career over this one fight. It's just, but it's a little bit different when it comes to him. Um, so yes, he has the automatic rematch clause. And me on the outside looking in, I just feel like a male's ego of pride. He's just going to be like, yeah, we're going to run this back. And he's going to try, you know, we'll see if that actually happens or not. Uh, we're all going to watch if it does, even if it turns out like this again. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to see what both of them do next. You know, I'm interested to see, you know, who Bud is going to fight next with all these people coming out of the woodworks chirping a lot um, to see what he's going to do next um, and to see how Spence bounced back because, you know, People were calling for his retirement and all types of crazy nonsense. Um, when, yeah, he lost the fight. It doesn't mean he's not going to be able to bounce back, you know, and, and win and continue on in his career. So I'm interested to see what both of them do going forward. But, yeah, Bud just, I mean, he thoroughly whooped him. There, there was no, there was no contemplating. There was nothing that anybody could say. If you say anything else, you don't even have the slightest idea of, what boxing is because I feel like people who don't even really understand boxing could have watched this and saw that he got his ass beat. So if there's anybody that says anything different, I, I don't even know what you were watching. For me, um, 
actually doing it before, but also being a fan ever since or whatever, and really watching these guys throughout their career. Because I watch boxing almost as much as I do uh, basketball. Um, the reason why I've always said Bud would get him is because you know, people have saying he's more technical. It's because he can literally fight equally both ways. That's hard to deal with. That's like guarding a basketball player that can play left-handed and right-handed. You it, like, what are you taking away? And he got all the skill. It, it's hard to deal with that. That's why you don't really see too many people doing that. Um, and he he has power in both. Normally, when people switch up, they had power one way. They just switch up to throw off the opponent. Not not with Bud. He, he's still the equal equally as dangerous either way, and he's inflicting pain on you. The thing about so he can take you out in multiple ways. He can do it defensively. He can come at you with power. He can go southpaw. He can go traditional. He he can take you out multiple ways. It's just a matter of him figuring out what you're trying to do. Errol Smith has one way, and that's to break you down, and that's to come at you with power, beat the hell out of you, and you eventually break down. Then he knocks you out. That's what he does. But the thing is about Spence is if when you run into a fighter that can take your power, what can you adjust to? And that's what we saw. The thing that really saw will, will convince me that Spence was in trouble early is when, when they grappled and Bud roughed them off of him and it looked like Drago hitting young Creed and, and Creed too. And he's and he flew back around. I'm like, oh shit, I ain't never seen that happen to Spence. I'm like, oh, so you don't even have that advantage. Like he just bullied you, dog. And Spence ain't get mad. It was like he knew. Just like what we saw, what it was, and I was like, uh, "Unless he get a lucky shot, he ain't winning this. He 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 about to get fucked." And, and me and Coach was sitting here watching the jump. I was like, "He in trouble." I ain't never seen that happen. And Lord, man, and when Crawford saw that, he went to work. He went to work, man. And even Crawford said it. He got hit with an overhand right. He said he got me right on the butt. And, and I was like, "Damn, that's it." Oh, he's like, "Oh, it's over." Like I could take your power, but I know you can't take mine. I just saw it. It's over, and he just started unloading on the man, and, and um, it got it got bad, man. And and that's why people similar to basketball, you got to watch the fights, man. People were picking Spence because of the the, I feel like the entertainment value, how he break dudes down and knock people out and stuff like that. But against other world champions, that's not always gonna be the case. That you got you got to switch stuff up. You see what I'm saying? And it's like back in the day with Ali and Foreman. Foreman had all the power. I mean. He was beating dudes so bad, they would get knocked out and wake back up and snuggle and then fall back down. Like, that's how hard he was hitting dudes. So, of course, Ali, I'm not even about to get in a slugfest with this dude. I'm going to sit here, I'm going to protect myself, and I'm going to rope a dope. I'm going to let him punch himself out. And that's what he did. And then he went to work. You got to switch your styles up sometimes. Call the rope a dope. You got to switch your styles up. And that's what Crawford is a master at. Bud has never done that. So, I'm like, if he get in trouble, who going to switch? And he has no adjustment. And you saw that. So he showed a lot of heart and will. He kept coming back. But, I mean, he kept running into a bunch of punches. That's all it was, man. You see what I'm saying? And all the people had in mind, he was in a car accident, man. Dog, read up on these. Brian Crawford got shot in the head in 08, early in his career. So don't you think he would be susceptible to head shots if that's the case? No, nah, bro, I ain't, I ain't trying to hear that. No, no excuses. He got the hell beat out of him. It happens from time to time. To some of the greats, it does. You see what I'm saying? Ali's the greatest of all time. Larry Holmes beat the hell out of him when he was too old to be in the ring. It sucked. It hurt, but that's part of it. If you're going to get in there, you got to take it. And I give Spence all the credit in the world, Max. He manned up. Made no excuses. Sat up there on stage afterward, man. Crawford in it with the fishnet. Basically telling where I caught the big fish and all that stuff like that. Talking all the trash. Like, respect on the world. Lumped up. See the memes talking about he looked like Martin in real life when he fought Hitman Hearns, which was which was crazy. And he ain't he, he didn't duck not like I, I got beat. He was the better man and like good shit. Like I can't even that was just a I got my ass with like I ain't know what the hell was happening. And so you just gotta respect that. And you can tell they the mutual respect that they had for one another, but Bud Crawford a different animal, dog. And maybe people will start appreciating boxing, the art of boxing, the tech, the technicality. And if you don't believe me. Google, I mean, I'm YouTube, Roy Jones Jr., and Antonio Tarver, and their breakdown of the fight afterwards. They broke that shit down to a T, man. They even said early in the round, he said they both, Roy Jones pointed out this. He said, I've never seen a fighter start bleeding in that color and his face start lumping up that quick in a fight. 
that early in a fight. You talking about end of the first round, second round, he looked like he had been in like a 10 round war, like he was just getting beat on. He said, That's not normal. So he said, You can't, he said, Look, it's no excuse, but the, that, that car accident did have a take its toll on him. It's only so much a human body can take. But at the same time, the reason why, and, he, and Roy Jones said, he said, the reason why I said Bud would beat him and Errol Smith got mad at me and stopped talking to me is he told me I was hating. And he said, no, he has more ways to beat you. You only have one way. So how am I, how, I'm just going off what I saw. And it ended up being right. And you notice leading up to the fight, actual boxers who weren't connected to nobody, just neutral, they all said Bud for that very reason. Because they know what they're looking at. The fans said Errol Smith, even on interview. And Bud, and the thing about Bud, man, it was so cold how he handled every media drama. When they would say Smith to his face or whatever, he was like, man, he calm as ever. Like, man, all that more power, bigger, blah, blah, blah. How do we know? We ain't been in the ring yet. I don't know nothing. That's what y'all say. You know, and that's what people do. They project what they can't handle on other people. But Bud, like, bro, y'all not me. And, man, did he prove it, bro. Like, that, that was one of the best – Masterclass boxing, like everything you want to see in a boxer, he did it. He did it, man. And it, it was just dominant, bro. Like it was just and like and like uh Ray said, there are other people, you know, Boost Ennis. I don't think he's ready, he's young. Uh Charlo at the next division, man. He gotta be Canelo. I think they they are next. He may, but I haven't seen enough of him when he fights with him where I think he can mess with Crawford. Canelo got a rebound from the ass whooping he he just took. So we don't know about that. Right now, this dude is number one. He's the king. And he's the king. Like, he called the shots now. So, all these people calling him out basically looking at the money. That's all it really is. He's the cash cow, and they know that right now. You know what I'm saying? But real real talk, they, they don't want those problems. And I think a lot of them are going to try to – they're going to try to um, catch him when he's older, hopefully, or hoping he's older and past his prime. And, and, and catch him in a point where, like, he may be a little slower or whatnot, then I'll take him out. But I don't – no, this is the best I've ever seen, but look, man, especially the caliber. Like, it's like every time he – it's like every time he faces a challenge, he rises above it. He don't meet the challenge. He rises above it. And that's a sign of an all-time great. And you got to put him up there with the greatest welterweights of all time. You got to, especially at that other performance. It, he made Errol Spence, who's a bad mark. He made him look like, bro, did you just get this dude out of the crowd to fight? Like, it looked that bad. Like, he had nothing, no answer. All he had was hard to just keep going. And and I respect that about him. But, bro, the ref had to save you from yourself because if it would have kept going, this might have been the end of your career. Because Crawford, was he, he was warming up to get that kill shot because he was trying to let you go slow. And then, all right, you keep coming. All right, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm just I'm gonna finish you. You see what I'm saying? And that's what happened, man. But, dog. Leave that man alone. If I'm Crawford, I'm not even talking to nobody, man. Like, I'm going to let y'all fight it out for a little bit, and I'm going to chill. And honestly, I think Smith should chill for a while. He need to, he need to heal because that was a hell of a beating he took, man. You can't come back in six months or later this year, talking about December and all that, and run, like you risking really ending that jump. Like, you really, you really risking it, man. So, man, so let, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people actually got to see greatness on that stage. And, and people don't come with the hot takes afterwards, man. That's what people do. But, but that's like what greatness really looked like. And um, <laughs> and one of my uh, OGs texted me. He said, man, he said, I ain't seen an ass whooping between two all-world players of this caliber since Jordan and Clyde Drex in the first half of the finals. I was like, damn, you. that's a good-ass comparison. That's how, like, first half is over. Don't compare this dude to me no more. That's how it was. Like, in this debate, I'm better. Let's keep it moving. So, Man, um, I'm glad Bud. I'm glad Bud won because also it helps. My last point: it helps a lot of boxers who go outside of the 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 janky ass promoting, you know, what I'm saying circle, and you gotta go the hard way to get fights and prove yourself. And then when you finally prove yourself, you on top of the mountain where the promoters and stuff got to do basically what you say. That's a hard pill, don't. I think like Floyd did it, Roy Jones Jr. did it. Not many fighters are good enough to do it, but he he did it. And um, after they tried to blackball him, they they hit fighters. They won't let fighters certain fighters fight him because he wouldn't um, he he wouldn't let certain people promote him and stuff. He, he fired certain promoters or whatnot because they was robbing him. I mean, you got this dude said his first professional fight he made six hundred dollars. 
Like, it's ridiculous to see him come up from that to now. Probably made nine figures from this fight. And he pretty much that that's what he pretty much gonna make for the rest of his career until he retires. So if I'm him, I will be selective. And honestly, he's unified. So I will make sure the next fight will probably be my last. And I'm gonna try to unify another weight class. So I could be the only three time unified champion in three weight classes. And I walk away with the cash, man. Ain't nothing else to prove, man. I'm Andre Ward, baby, undefeated. That's it. a hell of a display put on this past Saturday. Uh, I want to thank y'all for tuning in. As always, don't forget, uh, you can watch Focus TV weekly every Wednesday at 9 a.m. on our Roku channel. Um, look, don't forget to get over to the FocusTV.com, and we'll see you guys very soon.